So, again, today we are in a series called Clear Answers to Sticky Questions. And, and when we say that, from a church perspective, we mean uh, we want to get clarity from God's Word. We want to get clarity around some of the social, uh, political, uh, ideological um, spiritual issues that we're dealing with the series. Um, we believe the Word of God has something to say about it, and we believe we can find it in the Word of God. And so uh, this is our theme verse, just to help you kind of bring it to memory. Uh, Psalm 119, 105 says, Your Word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. This is a, a great verse that I memorized as a kid, uh, just to help me understand that, you know, we're going to trust the Word of God to be uh, to illuminate, to, to, to kind of guide us and to be the light we need for the steps that we're taking in our life. Uh, here's some stats, uh, just a few quick stats um, that I find troublesome sometimes, uh, but I want to give them to you. This is from a Barna uh, poll, Barna research poll. Uh, this is um, about the topics and conversations we're going to talk about today and over the next couple weeks. They reviewed or, or polled 384,000 churches and pastors uh, in this particular poll in 2018, and they came back with a couple of statistics. One, that 90% of them agree that there are cultural and social issues that are addressed in Scripture. So some of the issues we're dealing with over the next couple of weeks, I say, hey, 90%, it should be 100, but 90% of the 384 say, yes, the Scripture does address these things and does talk about it. Here's the stat that bothers me. 72% of them will not teach or preach on them because it is politically divisive and, so, and because of the social ideology behind it. Um, and that is a shame. That is, that is a cultural a disaster, especially for the church and especially for what we're called um, to do. And so today we're going to talk specifically about sexual sin, but I, I want to talk about it from a broad standpoint and kind of narrow in a little bit because, uh, you know, you see some of the things up here uh, that I have up here on the, on the post-its. You know, depending on, you know, where you are, if, you were to, if I were to say, hey, you know, give these a scale of 1 to 10, you know, uh, you know, 1 being... I don't know, not that bad, and 10 being evil, like pure evil, right? Um, you know, everybody in this room, there's probably 100 or so people in the room, I don't know how many are tuned in online, but, you know, even with just this small collection, you would find that there would be people who would be pretty similar in terms of how they would scale things, and then you'd find some folks that are pretty, pretty different in how they put things up there. I mean, you know, you might say lying, oh, that's a one maybe a half a point, you know, on that one. Uh, you know, the homosexual or gay lifestyle, maybe you have a feeling about that. Maybe that's higher number. Um, gossip, you know, what is gossip? Really, right? Is that really gossip? You might, you might say that's one thing. And then rape, you know, like what, what, do, you, what do you put that? Well, that's, a, that's huge. That's a big one. Um, but here's the reality is that even with just things like lying and gossip, you have people that you might have a, a, someone who, you know, their whole life was wrecked. By, by an affair in their marriage, by betrayal. And they might view lying and dishonesty as a five or seven in their life. They might see gossip as nothing but slander and things that ruin people's life. They might score that again like a, a five versus a one or something, something else. I mean, that's one of those things that you just start seeing. There's really some pretty big differences in how people might view things. And then I shared with you on week one of this series a little bit about just how our worldview shapes even how we see some of these things. And I shared with you some of those statistics, but I want to give you the, the root study. Um, this is the, the big one. 51% of American adults say that they have a biblical worldview, but only 6% of American adults actually hold to a biblical worldview. What does that mean? And I told you the first week that 4%, it's 4% for Gen Z, only 4%, but 6% was the average. And so what did that mean? Well, it means basically this next quote, which is in 2020, they said what they were realizing is that based on how people answered questions, really did, like they said they had a biblical worldview, but then they answered questions and they realized that, wow, you don't hold to that view at all. Why? Because other worldviews began to influence Christian beliefs about the way the world is and about how it ought to be in, for us, how it is and how it ought to be. And so, you know, I'll just give you a few examples. 72% of 
of Christians. Again, remember these are Christians we're, we're talking about. 72% really do believe that people are basically good. They're basically good. Now, I don't know where they get that <laughs> at all. But that's what they believe. Again, that's how the world is and how things ought to be. Uh, 58% actually state that if someone's good enough or really does good things, they probably can earn their way to heaven. One, or sorry, two out of four, which is still a little bit, just a hair shy of 50%, two out of four believe in karma. You know, you give what you get and you receive what you, you know, what you put out there. Um, here's one that threw me. One out of every four, again, one out of every four Christians, 25%, believe that right or wrong does have some root of individual beliefs. So right or wrong has kind of got some relative idea to it, which again goes back to even kind of the scale that we just, uh, we just talked about. And the reality is, is that this didn't just happen. You know, it didn't just happen. It, it, it's been happening over time uh, for decades upon decades, even centuries. You know, the reality is, is that the Christian life, the Christian worldview um, continues to be influenced by other worldviews, by other ideas, by other religions, by other social ideologies, in which, for us at least, better defines how we feel like the world is or how we would like the world to be. And it's been happening for a long time. It's not a brand new thing. We didn't just wake up to this, right? Like, it didn't just happen over COVID. Like, it wasn't one of those things. It's been happening for a very, very long time. And again, when it comes to how we see sin... And we're, again, we're, today we're sp specifically talking about some sexual sin, but how you see sin really has a lot to do with that. And so here's a, a scale. You've probably seen me um, talk about this before if you've been a journey for a while. Um, but this is, this is a good thing to just kind of remem remember. When we view this, especially when it comes to sin or how you define sin, it's kind of this scale. See the little rulers here about what's, some, you know, one to ten Evil, not so bad, good, not good, that kind of thing. And, and, then, and then there's a line. Everybody know what the line is, right? Okay, like, for example, gossip, lying, cheating, stealing, greed, right? It's like some people would find those somewhat socially acceptable, but there's a line, right? There's a line. And, and, and you know when you cross the line because somebody tells you, you went over the line, Right? I mean, all my kids did this. I'm, I got my youngest one now, you know, still in the, in the height of it. But all my kids did this when they would just both lay, face lie to my face. And then they would be like, oh, I'm just kidding. Right? I'm just kidding. No, you're lying. Right? Like, that's a lie. Like, you, you know, I don't know what a white lie is, but it's a lie. It's still a lie. And so, again, in the way we view man's view of it is that there's some things that kind of fall in this early shade, and then there's a line that you could cross that really does start to kind of qualify as bad or sin or however you want to call it. And then we have things that, that we know are there, anger, anger issues, sexual sin, um, uh, abuse, right? Could be physical, could be verbal, could be anything like that. We, we see those in shades of getting worse and worse, like some's bad, some's worse than others. And then we have some that are, that we, the majority so in terms of Christians, again, I'm talking about Christians, the majority of people see this as bad, like evil, porn, molestation, um, uh, murder, rape, right? Like they, there would be a common or a consensus to a certain degree of these things. Now, here's the deal. It's not just Christians who do this. Everyone really does this. You can add all sorts of things up there. But again, today, I just want to talk about believers, Christians, Christians who basically take this, this scale of, of good, bad, not so bad, worse, you know, uh, really bad, evil, and because that's how we view it. Again, it's, it's, the, it's the worldview that, that just kind of helps us deal with the way the world is and the way it ought to be. We project that on God. We project that, on, that that's how God sees it, Right? That he's not that worried about your little white lie and your, and your, and your greedy heart and that kind of thing. Uh, oh, he'd have a problem with your anger issue, right? But he's got a much bigger problem with people who rape and, and, do, and murder. Does that make sense? Like, we put that on God as if that's the way God sees it. So we have to, we have to work out. Before we can dive into why we treat sexual sin this way through this weird kind of sliding scale, we have to deal with 
what the Word of God really does say. So here's, here's a passage you've heard us read before. This is 2 Timothy 3.16. That all Scripture, all Scripture is inspired by God, written by God, given to us from God. Yes, it's over 1,500 years that it was written. Yes, 66 books uh, touch three different continents and three different languages. I think four continents, three languages, uh, 40 plus authors. And yet we believe, because it's the inspired word of God given to us about the story of God, that it is inspired by God, infallible, inerrant. And it's useful. It's used to teach us. Now, I'm going to have you read these yellow words out loud, right? What does it teach us? It teaches us what is true, right? Like it teaches us what is true. And it helps us realize what is wrong, right, in our lives. It it corrects us, right, when we are wrong. And it teaches us to to do what? What does it teach us? Yeah, it teaches us to do right, right and wrong, true. That's what it does. It says God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. We believe the word of God has been given to us to be that source, to be the absolute truth. And then as, as, as uh, many different uh, uh, translations define it, to, rebe- to rebuke, to correct, to encourage, to equip. That that is the power of what the word of God uh, does. And so when you start looking at it in terms of sexual sin, you can go to some of these verses. I'm going to choose one that kind of has this kind of all-encompassing, you know, language to it. It's, it's, it becomes very common. It would have been very common to them to hear these words in their language. So here's Paul writing to the church in Thessalonica. And he says that God's will is for you to be holy. So he wants you to stay away from all sexual sin. Some translations say sexual immorality. Stay away from all sexual sin, all sexual immorality. And it says this, that that each of you will control his own body and live in holiness and honor. Not in lustful passion like the pagans who do not know God or his ways. So Paul defies this and says, if there's two people at the table, it's people who will, will take responsibility for their actions and control their body. And then there's people who don't know God. Like they, they don't, you know, like last week we talked about Jesus being the way. They don't know the way. They don't know his ways and they don't know God. And they're pagan. So they, they just sort of live out their, their desires, their lustful passions. And the word there, again, it would have been a very common word. The word is pornea. All right? The word is pornea. So, um, oh, sorry, I should have moved these earlier. So this is lying. That's not that bad, right? Gossip, not that bad. I should have moved these earlier. Uh, So that bad. And we didn't talk about this one yet, but we will. I can't do it. Goodness gracious. Um, Sticky notes. All right. And so we've got the scale, but this word, this word pornea, it's a Greek word. And it would have been a commonly used word. Now, yeah, everybody looks at it and be like, is that where we get the word from? Yes, it's where we get the word from. Okay? Everything started in Greece. All right? That's the, no, not really. Not, not really, but the Greeks like to say that. Anyway, uh, we stole everything from the Greeks. So, pornea, yeah, that's, that's the word. And again, it was an all-encompassing. It really meant every kind of sexual immorality. And it would have been like, does it mean this? Does it mean this? Does it mean this? And if it had anything to do with sexual morality, it would have been like, yeah, that's what that word means. It was an all, it was used about, tw- I think it was used 25 times in 24 different verses in the New Testament in Greek because it was a common phrase. It would have been like you and I using the word stuff. Everybody with me? When I say stuff, you know what that means? Stuff, right? Why? Because I got stuff and you got stuff and we know what stuff means. It would have been exactly the same. It would have been like using that word, throwing it out there, and saying, pornea, and be like, oh, okay, I get that. That's that's every kind, all-encompassing sort of bucket, if you will, of sexual immorality. And Paul uses this to say, yeah, I want you to be careful and to be cautious, if you will, of all sexual immorality. And then we're going to read along here in 1 Corinthians 6. Go ahead and turn to your... um, your portion of God's word, 1 Corinthians 6, 12. We're starting at verse 12. 
He does get a little specific in here, but this is, this is again, he's gonna, you're going to see the word pornea show back up in this, but he's kind of helping them understand, not just, hey, you control yourself or you don't. He's actually helping them walk through the arguments that, that, that the church and the people, the people in Corinth were struggling through. So here's how he says, and he starts in verse 12. He says, you say, he's talking to the, the Corinth people. He says, you say, I'm allowed to do anything, uh, but not everything is good for you, right? And this is him kind of rebutting that. You say, I'm allowed to do everything, but look, not everything's good for you. And even though I'm allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. You say, hey, food was made for the stomach and the stomach for food. And then my, in my Bible, the parenthesis says that is true, although someday God's going to go do away with both of them. He says, but you can't say that our bodies were made for pornea, for stuff, for sexual stuff, just because that's our drive, that's our desire, that's our... He says, you can't say that our bodies were made for. They're, they were made for the Lord, and the Lord cares about our bodies, and God will raise up the dead by his power, just as he raised our Lord from the dead. Don't you realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ? Should a man take his body, which is now part of Christ, and join it with a prostitute? Never. And don't you realize that if a man joins himself with a prostitute, he becomes one body with her? For the scriptures say the two are united to one, but the person who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Run from sexual sin, from sexual immorality. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was, and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God brought, bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your bodies. Right? I mean, he goes on to basically just say, look, he's trying to help them understand a little bit better because they're making the argument that, look, just because it's natural, just because it's normal, just because these are the drives and the, and the desires in our hearts and the way we're attracted and our appetites, that, that basically because we were made for, because our bodies do that, we must be made for that. Like that, that's just a natural thing to sort of live that out. And he says, no, you don't understand that. And he starts to give some examples. And he says, but at the end of the day, he's wanting them to understand that no matter whether it was all pornea, whether it was all sexual sin, or in this case, he was talking about prostitution because they were actually doing that in the temple. Okay, not, not, not the church temple, but in the, in, their, in, the, in the temple there in Greece, they were doing that in the temple as a, as a type of worship to like use their bodies in that way. And he's like, no, 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 you are one. You are doing what God has intended to just be one. And what he wants them to see is that all sexual sin really does kind of result, and he, you know, again, we can go through several verses. It all comes from this self-indulgent standpoint. It's all about the self. It's all about just doing what your body craves, what your body desires. So everything from lust, and this is all the stuff listed in the New Testament, from lust to porn and pornography to premarital sex uh, to abortion. Abortions, we're going to talk about that in a minute, but adultery, prostitution, sexual fluidity, right? And I, I, you could, uh, you know, the LGBTQ, because it's all encompassing now, um, that wouldn't just be sexual fluidity. It would also be gender fluidity as well, uh, pedophilia, rape, incest, like the, these are the things that get addressed. And every time they're addressed, they're addressed from the context of self-indulgence, that you need to know what the prime driver is and you need to see what God's word actually says about this. So what happens? How do we get to, to the place where we are? Well, let me just give you a few examples. Uh, let's use this one as an example. This is uh, premarital sex. Okay, let's just use that as an example. Premarital sex. Okay. Um, we used to view this, you know, kind of across the line. Most, and again, we're talking about Christians, okay? We're not talking about the world. We're talking about Christians. We used to view that as across the line. Look, that's, that's sin, okay? Like, you can't do that. I mean, anybody growing, grew up in a church where the word fornication was used? You guys remember any, that original F word, fornication? Yeah. 
That's, that's what that is, right? And that was sex outside of marriage. It really meant sex outside of marriage, but we oftentimes just used it when it came to like heterosexual premarital sex, but it really meant all sex outside of marriage was fornication. And he says, you know, this was viewed as a sin. This was viewed as something that, as, as wrong. But over time, over decades, we, we, because it's so tied to self-indulgence and our needs and desires, we now champion that it's not a sin at all. Matter of fact, it's more or less expected. It's more or less something that it's viewed as so natural and so normal. I mean, what are we, my, you know, this is my grandfather's church. You know, it's like, it's so norm, normative in our culture that there's no way you could say it's across the line or that it might possibly be a sin because it's really, again, it's not about two people becoming one. There's kind of like the Corinthians. It's like, we're just two people self-indulging, right? Like, that's kind of the way it's viewed. It's like, we're just two people just kind of meeting our own needs and desires. You can't say that's wrong. You can't, you can't call that a sin. Again, look at the, the, the sin of abortion. Now, abortion, we're going to talk more about it next week because abortion has some context to it. But the, reason, the only reason abortion exists is because of sex. Everybody, everybody with me? Nod your head. I don't have to explain this any further. Okay, um, it's the only reason it exists, right? Because no sex equals no abortion. That's, I know that's what people want to just say as a simple solution, but that's, that's the reality, right? No, no sin, uh, no, uh, or no sex, no abortion. But the reality is that abortion is tied to sexual sin. That's, that's what it is. It's a sin in and of itself. We'll talk about it next week, but, you know, it's part of this. And, and again, at one time, it was really viewed from the Christian faith as being a sin. And now again, it's, it's more about what we have the right to do. It's, it's about what we are able. Once again, kind of like, well, we're able to, so therefore we can. And again, understand, abortion is driven by that aspect of self-need and self-desire because of how it affects me, the person who needs to have the abortion. You can't tell me what to do with my body. Is everybody, everybody with me? Okay. Now, go to like, um, uh, I'm going to just put up one sticker here, but, you know, even with the homosexuality and the uh, transgenderism, uh, you know, I know it's all linked together in this, you know, a bunch of initials. But at one time, even not that long ago, just a few decades ago, it really would have been viewed differently even by Christians, because Christians, even as the ones that sort of began to find acceptance or began to find ways to kind of justify or minimize or affirm uh, same-sex attraction and homosexual lifestyles, they were, there were people who, who sort of like did that, but they didn't accept transgenderism, right? Like there was a, there was a divide. And now, again, now you can't do anything because, because both of those things are still rooted in self-fulfillment, in self-desire, in, self, in, in self-identity. It's so rooted in this that you can't say it's wrong. There's no possible way it could be a sin when it's so tied to me. It's so tied to self. And again, Christians, don't, not the world, not pagans, Christians who follow Jesus as the way, have taken all these things and they've justified and they've minimized and they've affirmed, made excuses for, tried to rewrite what the Bible may or may not said. Oh, that's not what that word means. They added that word later in life and blah, 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 blah. And they start quibbling over, well, that's, I mean, that's somehow some translations do it. That's not how some. So how does God see it? Oh, by the way, before we do that, let me, let me pause. I do want to address this really quickly. So going back to that passage we just read, the temptation again for us to put our sliding scale and to put that on God is real. But when it comes to sexual sin, Paul does tell us why we do view it a little bit differently. Understand, that does not mean that God sees it differently in terms of sin, but he does kind of give us this realization that sexual sin, sin does have its own, its own definition. And here's what he says. I'm going to use the message paraphrase uh, for it. He says, there's a sense in which sexual sins are different, right, than the others. Why? Because in sexual sins, we violate the sacredness of our own bodies. We, we violate the, the image of God 
in us. These bodies that were made for God-given and God-modeled love for becoming one with one another. Right? Like, like we, take, we take what God has created and we distort it. And, and when we sin, it, it affects us. And it always affects at least two people, if not more, because the act of sex is with two people. Don't you realize that our bodies are sacred place, the place of the Holy Spirit? This is, again, the, the message paraphrase of like, the reason that we view it so differently is because, and I'll just say this as a pastor, when I talk with people, nothing in their past, nothing in someone's past usually carries the weight of shame or guilt quite like sexual sin, all right? And that doesn't matter whether you are the abuser, right, the fornicator, right, the adulterer, or if you're the victim or the one that also engaged or the one that received, like, it doesn't matter. One's, one's guilt, one's trauma, one's, it, it affects you because it's going against God's image bearers. So we, when he says that, we wear the sin in our bodies, like it's because it is different. Like I just want you, to, I want to make sure you hear and understand that. That's one of the reasons that, quite honestly, sexual sin and, 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 and the trauma from sexual sin does require an incredible amount of counseling and prayer and healing, right? Because... It is significant to how it affects us. See how differently it is that it's all driven by self. And there's nothing more that it damages than self. And so here's how Paul shows us how God sees this. Okay, we're going to go to Romans 1. Now, we're going to look at Romans for a couple minutes today. But we're going to look at Romans 1. And this is Paul talking to the Christians, the church, in Rome, okay? Now, just a case for you to know, just just to help you understand, um, some people like to argue, and they start arguing and quibbling over, well, the the Bible didn't say that, and he doesn't mean homosexual. That word doesn't mean homosexual. That one doesn't translate like that. That doesn't mean that they didn't do it like that in, in, in the ancient days. I just want you to understand something. He wrote to Rome, and the Roman Empire, uh, at, at best, you would blush at what they championed, and at worst, you would lose your lunch at what they championed. Okay? I'm telling you, we are not there yet. I mean, we might be headed that direction, but we are not at the level of debauchery that the, that the Romans were at the time that Paul wrote this, when it came to what people championed and allowed when it came to sexual sin. So remember, who he's writing to, okay? He's not writing to a bunch of people who didn't, didn't know what any of these things meant. He's writing them to help them understand how God sees it. So here's Romans 1. He says this, and we talked about this in, in week one. We said, we read, we read part of this. He said, God showed his anger, right? He showed his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppressed the truth by their wickedness. They, they were suppressing the truth. They knew the truth about God because he made it obvious to them. Ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth, they've seen the sky, uh, uh, through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his external power, his divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Keep going. Um, actually, hold on. This is where, I'm going I'm to skip a few verses, but we read them in the first week. And it's primarily, the, this is where they started making things in, in human image. They came up with the pantheon of gods, the Roman gods, the Greek gods, like all that stuff. They, they worship birds or cows or the sun or the moon. This is why they did that. And it goes on to 25 to say, that they, what did they do? They traded the truth for a lie. It was just an exchange, right? They justified, minimized, made excuses. That's all the same words for they traded the truth for a lie. They worshiped and served the things of God created instead of the creator himself who was worthy of eternal praise. And then he goes on. This is where he gets into it. That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men. And as a result of their sin, they suffered within themselves. See the language again. They suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. Now just, just understand, this is why I take people to Romans 1. They want to quibble over words or quibble over this, this translation and this thing. Look, 
Romans is when Paul takes out the Barbie dolls and he just says, he takes two cans and goes, this is what they were doing. Everybody with me? Like that's, they, they, he all but drew the picture. Like I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna let you quibble over words. I'm gonna tell you by their actions what they were doing and why it was dishonoring God. It says, uh, oh, sorry, they, they wore that in themselves. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should ever be done. And their lives became <laughs> full of every kind of wickedness, right? Sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They're backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, boastful. They invented new ways of sinning, and they disobeyed their parents. They refused to understand. They broke their promises. They were heartless. They had no mercy. And it says they knew God's justice required that those who do these things deserve to die, yet they did them anyway. Worse than that, they encouraged others to do it too. Worse than them doing it themselves. They championed it. They affirmed it to let others do it as well. All right? This is where Paul goes to, to God's view. Again, he, he shows the distance. And again, this wouldn't have been, this, these words would have all been common for them. But he shows the distance between God's holiness, which is why he said they deserve death. Right? But you got to look at that list and be like, but that list is weird because, again, it's not our sliding scale. You know, he's got murder and witchcraft and wickedness and, and, and sexual fluidity with not obeying your parents. Like, that's on the same list as gossip and lying and cheating. And he, this wasn't a conclusive thing. He said they just made up new ways to sin. This is because he wanted them to understand this is how God sees sin. It's all the same. Anything outside of his holiness is sin. Better way to say it, everything outside of this is sin. Including all these things that we kind of have a sliding scale for, this, these sexual um, sin that we justify and minimize and one of the reasons is, again, some, you know, you gotta get, got to get involved in a lot of the discussion, but sometimes people will have that conversation about, well, how much is nature, how much is nurture, and you start getting into the, how could, how could it be a sin if God created this, and I was born this way, and God doesn't make mistakes, and they start, they start kind of working through this argument. Um, and here, here's the reality. I, I always try to help people understand that, you know what, that's true, especially when you start dealing with people who don't really trust the Bible is true. And I will say, you're not wrong. You were born, you were born this way, and so was I, because we were born broken. And all of us carry brokenness with us. And that brokenness didn't come because we chose to be broken. It came because that's how we were made. That's how we were born. And then again, not, not, without them understanding original sin, without them understanding the fullness of the gospel, it, it's my way of trying to help people understand it is true. Our brokenness is real. We both have pornea. We both have stuff, right? But it does not change the consequences of our decisions. Here, here's a better way to say it. Our brokenness was born of sin. Not immorality, meaning you, didn't, you weren't born as a baby and decided to sin, right? You weren't born as a baby and had a bad thought, and now you're a sinner. You, it's not the first lie you, taught as a, you told as a toddler. Do you have, did you eat the candy off the table? No, I did not eat the candy off the table. You know, bam, you're a sinner. Like, that's not how it works, right? Our brokenness is, is innate. It was in us. It was born of sin. But... There are still moral choices that flow from how we respond to our brokenness, which means we're still accountable, which means it still matters, which means that, yeah, you were born, I was born, I get it, but how we respond and the choices we make are still ours, they're still ours. 
And they're still accountable to God's moral law. Yeah, that, that, that's the reality. So he sees sin this way and lists it all off, and we see how it is. And I mean, we have to understand that no matter how much justification we give to it, no matter how much we try to minimize or downplay it, no matter how much we try to affirm it for ourselves, it, it's all flying in the face of what God has already said. And the root of that is our brokenness. Now, this is important because this is, I have to read, go right into Romans 2. You can't read Romans 1 without reading Romans 2. I know people like to do it, and there's a lot of legalistic Christians that love it. Romans 1, get them. Ah, you know, like a sledgehammer against the, the big symbol. Get them, get them, God, get them. But Romans 2, Paul didn't take a lunch break. Like, this is Paul just pouring out theology about how we see and understand and how God views sin, and very quickly, almost immediately, Paul says this, you may think you can condemn such people, but you are just as bad and you have no excuse because he's talking to Christians. When you say they're wicked and should be punished, you're condemning yourself, right? You who judge others for doing the very same things. You're doing the same thing. Keep going. He says, we know that God in his justice is going to punish anyone who does these things. God is the judge. You're not the judge. He's the judge. And since, you're, you know, since you now judge others for doing the things, these things, why do you think you'll avoid his judgment when you do the same thing? Don't you see how wonderfully kind and tolerant and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that it's his kindness that's intended to turn you from your sin? Another version that I learned says it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. It's his kindness that leads us to repentance. And the reason that he says that, and I know the argument is immediate. The people in their heart just go, I don't understand why Paul said that because I'm not living that life. I'm not, I didn't have an abortion. I'm not, I'm not you know, abusing anyone. I didn't have sex before marriage. I didn't, uh, do, well, you know, I didn't do all those things. I didn't do it as much as someone else. You know, like, like, like our brain just continues to go, but that's not me. I'm not doing that. Why would he say we're doing the same thing? Because what Paul's actually saying is what we do is the same thing anyone else does is we find the way to justify our self-desire and we wipe it off the sin board. We do the exact same thing. Oh, sure, they do it with this, but you do it with that. And so you think they should be condemned and you are doing nothing but condemning yourself. That's how it works. That's what he means when he says you're doing the same thing. And I'll be honest, it's the thing that gives me such, oh gosh, like it, you, when, you, when you go down Roman, you follow the Romans road, right? And you get to Romans 7 and Paul starts sharing a bit of his own personal heart with, with people. And he says, you know, everything I want to do, I don't end up doing. And everything I don't want to do, I find myself doing. This is Paul just sharing his heart with them, he's like, I, like, like I have nowhere to, I have no leg to stand on. This is how powerful the work of sin is in people's lives. He says, I don't see, you know, the, 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 um, the, 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 the my mind says no, my body says yes. I don't want to do, I do, I, I don't want to do what's, what's wrong, but I end up doing it anyway. He, as a matter of fact, the paraphrase says, it happens so often it's predictable, right? And then he says, oh. Who can save me from this body slave to sin and death? And he says, thank God it's, it's Jesus Christ. See, Jesus changes things because it doesn't, he doesn't change the scale. God still sees his holiness and God still sees sin just as he described it, just as it is uh, in black and white, but he sees the blood applied through the grace and the work of Jesus Christ. And we have to begin to understand, we, it, is not, it is not what Jesus has done for us that allows us to justify our sin. It's, the, it's what Jesus has done for us that allows us to surrender and repent of our sin. 
and come to him. My sexual brokenness is just as real as yours. And we're not going to quibble over what your expression of that is versus what my expression of that is. We're going to surrender it to the cross. We're going to surrender it to what we said last week, to Jesus being the only way. And here's what the brother of Jesus said. James was such a wise, wise pastor and church leader to the church uh, there in Jerusalem. And here's what James says uh, to the church. He says this. He says, humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Same phrasing that Paul would use with resist from sexual immorality, resist from pornea. Like he will, you, you know, you resist the devil and he will flee. Why? Because when you humble yourselves, you come close to God and God will come close to you. And as you wash your hands, this is, this is uh, uh, figurative. As you wash your hands, you sinners, because that was what they did for purifying things. He says, you're going to purify your hearts. And why is this necessary? Because your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Because your loyalty is divided between God and the world. So how is it possible? And I, this may be some of you who struggle with this, but look, how is it possible for pastors and Christian leaders and maybe people in your life like parents or grandparents who proclaim the word of God, who claim Jesus to be the only way, and all of a sudden they get found out that they're addicted to pornography, that they've had a long-standing affair, that they've engaged in sexual misconduct, and sometimes worse. And if you're anything like me and the rest of the world, they just want to go, How do you reconcile that? And Paul would say, well, they do the same thing you do. They do the same thing you do. Because of their own selfish desires and needs, their their loyalties were divided between God and the world. And what they chose to justify, minimize, and affirm, they were just guilty of. That was it. I don't explain, that doesn't explain away the hurt that those things cause, but it does help us understand it's because it's the same sin that we are guilty of. The same justification, the same reasoning, and it is only Jesus Christ that's the solution. Here's what Paul said to Timothy, and I'm going to wrap us up here. Paul says this to Timothy about teaching these things. He says, I want you to teach these things and encourage everyone to obey. He's talking about the the word of God, but specifically talking about how they're to live. He says, some people may contradict your teaching, but these are wholesome teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ, the teachings that promote a godly life. They don't try to excuse away sin. They promote a godly life. He says, anyone who teaches something different, well, they're just arrogant and they lack understanding. Such a person has an unhealthy desire to quibble over the meaning of words. And this does nothing but stir up arguments, ending in jealousy and division and slander and evil suspicions. These people always cause trouble. Their minds are corrupt. And they've turned their backs on the truth. And he goes on to specifically talk about, look, to them, a show of godliness is just a way to become wealthy. It's just a facade. You know, it's a facade to appease and to keep them in good standing. And so Paul's telling Timothy, you've got to be weary of that. You've got to be careful with that. It doesn't mean that grace doesn't apply. It just means you've got to be careful of these false teachers, of people who really want to push false ideology that goes completely contrary to the Word of God. So what do we do? What do we do with these sticky questions as we engage what is crystal clear in Scripture? Well, I only have one suggestion, and that's we have to engage your gray matter. Okay? You have to engage your gray matter. Now, I am not telling you that these issues are gray matters. Everybody with me? Engage your gray matter is a way of saying you've got to use your brain. Okay, because the gray matter in the brain is what God gave you to process the information you've been given. 
The white matter is what communicates that information. The white matter communicates all that information in your brain to the gray matter to the rest of your body. But your gray matter was what was given to you by God to help you take information, process it, and think. Everybody with me? Nod your head. That was a great middle school lesson. Everybody with me? Now you're going to know. You're going to get you're gonna make excellent grades this year. Okay? That's your gray matter. And here's what we've been called to do. Romans 12, 2, right? We do not conform to the patterns of this world, but we are transformed by the renewing of our mind, by changing the way we think. Why? Because he gave you gray matter to do so. You're going to change the way you think. You're going to process this information. You're going to understand what is clearly communicated, the white matter, what's clear and black and white in Scripture. And you're going to use your gray matter to individually work through what this means as we approach and we are salt and light to this culture and to this community. It's when we do that, he says, that we can test and approve what God's will is, his good and perfect and pleasing will. I'm going to give you three, let me check my time. Yep, three, um, just practical. This is just stuff God laid on my heart this morning. Just practical steps of how you engage your gray matter and how you engage people in conversation. Um, when someone tells you that you have to affirm, now understand this, again, I'm talking about individuals, not groups of people. When someone individually tells you that in order to love them, you have to affirm and accept their chosen lifestyle, their chosen identity, whatever the, the case is. And, and I think this is where you need to use your brain and be honest with them. Okay, you need to be you need to be honest by saying, look, um, there's nothing in the Word of God that tells me that I'm allowed to do that. There's nothing in the Word of God that tells me that I'm allowed to affirm or accept sin just because it's culturally convenient to do so. There's nothing, and I can promise you, if I was going to affirm sin, first sin I'm affirming is mine. Everybody with me? I ain't worried about yours. Because what's going to happen is people will be like, well, I don't like that. Well, the Word of God says it's a sin. Well, I don't like that. I don't even believe the Word of God exists. Oh, okay, that's a whole other conversation. Uh, but that's what I believe. I believe what the Word of God is an absolute truth. And I have no choice, but I, so I can't. But I do love you. How can I love you and serve you well? Well, I don't like what it says. I don't like what it says. Right? I, look, you don't like what it says about your stuff. I really don't like what it says about my stuff. But I can promise you, it, he talks about both our stuff. Well, I don't like that the word of God condemns me. Again, it's not for guilt and shame. Jesus died on the cross for your guilt and shame. It's to convict us of what is wrong and to teach us about what is right. It's the purpose of the word of God. Uh, number two, again, this kind of leads into, you know, stop assuming that people, uh, stop assuming that people who don't believe in the word of God should. Stop assuming that just because, like, like just because we hold these values to be inerrant and, 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 and infallible doesn't mean that other people who don't care should care about what we care about. That is a dumb assumption. So stop doing that, okay? We're going to agree to disagree. That's fine. I hold to his truth. That's what I do. I can't help it. There's nothing else maybe to say from that point forward. I love you. How can I love you and serve you as Jesus would? But if you're in conversation with another believer in Christ and you have very divided views of what this means, uh, you need to engage your gray matter and you need to challenge them to engage their gray matter. Okay? Listen, I'll, just help me. Help me, show me the scripture, and help me see how God arrives at your conclusion. T I just need to, I'll, I, I will do my best to show you through scripture how God arrives at the conclusion that I've landed at. And maybe, I, you know, maybe it's something I can grow in. But I need you to show me how God arrives at that conclusion. 
Hear the words. I don't care how you arrived at it. I know how you arrived at it. Because it's whatever you want to arrive at. I can do the same thing. But when you engage your gray matter, you say, listen, we're both believers. We're going to see each other in heaven. We might as well get used to this conversation thing. But if you and I really, really differ in this, then I, I just got to challenge you. Just take me there. Show me. I call it the biblical math, right? Take, show me the biblical math of how you've arrived there. Not how you arrived, sorry, how God arrives there. How does he get there? And that sometimes ends the conversation. But at least it ends the conversation with the challenge of, I love you, how do we continue to walk forward? We may have to have this conversation again. And here's number three. Stop generalizing in your conversations with individuals, okay? Don't you hate it when you start talking to somebody and, and they blame every Christian, every person they ever met as a Christian and everything that they think Christians believe and they put that on you? Don't you hate that? I do, right? So listen, guys, you need to not do that, okay? Your gay neighbor, your, 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 your friend's kid who's struggling with their identity, look, that they, don't, they are not the, the ambassador and champion for every LGBTQ person in the world. So, so stop, stop generalizing things in their conversation. You need to remember that these people, this person, is, is made in the image of God and God loves them. And they've arrived here for a very specific reason. And it comes from their brokenness. All of our sin does. So stop generalizing and putting general things on people. Deal with people as individuals when you're in these conversations. That's part of what I mean by engaging the great matter. Humbly point them to the absolute hope that you have found in Jesus Christ. Here's, again, I'm gonna, I'll close with this. I said I was closing three times. I'm really closing this time. Here's how the message paraphrase says it in the same verse in Romans 12 too. It says, don't, don't become so well-adjusted in our culture that you fit into it. And read those words out loud, those three words, without even thinking. Okay, God gave you gray matter for a reason. He gave you your brain. He, he, he told us, and, and listen, you may be sitting here going like, well, that's not me. I don't deal with any of these sticky problems. So I don't really need to engage the gray matter in that. Well, I got news for you. Your kids are dealing with it. Your family members are dealing with it. And the people we're called to be salt and light to are dealing with it. So you better get your brain engaged and start dealing with it. Because these sticky questions aren't going anywhere. You need to continue to study and to learn. It is not okay to just dismiss this and to float along with culture as if we're not even paying attention to what's going on. It's not okay. Do not do that. Do not fit into this, this mold without even thinking. What? Instead, instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. And I love this, the way he ends this part. Unlike the culture around you always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God's going to bring the best out of you, developing well-formed maturity in you. And that's my desire for us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Uh, I'm, I'm challenged by um, just how you say we do the same thing. And God, I just confess as I've been preparing for this, I've just been um, struggling through what I do the same thing in. What are the things in my life that I justify and minimize and make excuses for and affirm because it's a whole lot easier for me to get what I want in life. God, I pray that as we engage these sticky matters and engage these questions in our culture, that um, you, we would study your word to see what is clear and that we would use our gray matter to just process and, and help us rethink, reshape the way we think and engage others so that we can love them better and humbly point them to you. We pray all this in your name, Jesus. Amen.